Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Welcome to the Green Zone and welcome to this very special event with Dr. Bashibi Fraser, CBE, who is one of the most uh, respected, renowned intellectuals in Scotland. I would like to thank you for coming in person and thank you also to everyone who's joining us online. You're very welcome. I would just like to take a minute uh, as well to thank all of the organisers. This is an absolute feat of organisation, isn't it? And it's all run so smoothly. Uh, a thank you to the whole Green Zone major events team, particularly Jules Richmond, who's been patient and efficient all, all the way through from March a few months ago onwards. So many thanks to him. And thank you also to the team of technicians here today, Alan and his team, who have made this available to people all over the world. And again, seamlessly with great flexibility and skill, thank you. And thank you to Katie, our room coordinator. My name is Beth Juner. I am uh, the director. I have a, an online art gallery, which previously had physical premises on a main street in St Andrews, Scotland. And in my gallery, I had an open door policy. So everyone was welcome. And people passing could come in and perhaps uh, make a discovery that art or one of the poems on the wall had something to speak to them. Every exhibition was accompanied by poetry and also a series of talks and debates. And this was to make manifest the principle that all of the arts have a contribution to make in social change. So I'm um, very grateful to have this platform in the Green Zone, where we're essentially looking to establish entirely new principles to live by. In the Green Zone, we're vigilant, of course, we're keeping an eye on what they're doing over in the, in the Blue Zone, the politicians and the big corporations. But here, we're working towards a shift in values that will protect all of us, all of humanity, from the destructive forces of the knowledge that we've unleashed. It's culture that humanizes our knowledge and it's creativity, creative thinking, that will get us out of this mess and away from these crimes of climate injustice and all its consequent injustices. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bashabi Fraser, CBE. When we listen to Bashabi Fraser today, I'd like us to keep in mind that in all her work of scholarship and poetry, she exemplifies this essential principle where knowledge and compassion for all peoples coexist and indeed are inseparable. Through both her scholarship and poetic vision, Dr. Fraser's work embodies exactly the kind of vision that is really the only way out of this state of emergency. Knowledge in the hands of the so-called powerful is perfectly capable of unleashing not destructive forces, but instead the life-sustaining forces of the very best of our human potential. Dr. Pashabi Fraser, PhD, CBE, is Professor Emerita of English and Creative Writing at Edinburgh Napier University. 
She is the director of the Scottish Centre of Tagore Studies, is an Associate Royal Literary Fund Fellow and an Honorary Fellow at the Centre for South Asian Studies at the University of Edinburgh. Professor Fraser is an award-winning poet, children's writer, editor, and a renowned academic. Her work traverses continents in bridge-building literary projects. She has audit, edited and authored 23 books, published articles and chapters, both academic and creative and as a poet. She has been widely anthologized. She's the chief editor of the peer-reviewed international e-journal, Gitanjali and Beyond, and is on the editorial board of the Royal Literary Fund's Writer's Mosaic. Bashapi was awarded CBE in this year's Queen's New Year's Honours for her contributions to education, for her academic achievements, culture, for her poetry, and integration, for her work connecting Scotland and India. Her other awards in Scotland and India are numerous, they're very numerous, <laughs> and uh, can be found on her website, bashabifraser.co.uk, where you'll also find details of all her books, both academic works and collections of poetry. Bashabi will be reading some of her poetry today and giving us an introduction to Tagore. And towards the end of the session, we'll be taking questions from slido.com. And uh, you can access Slido either through scanning, there it is on the screen, uh, through scanning the QR code, or you can copy the long code, that hashtag code, and put that into the slido.com website. So we look forward to taking questions from you uh, in the room and also online. So please give a very warm Glasgow and world welcome to Dr. Bashabi Fraser, CBE. In case you think I'm very tall, I'll tell you a secret. I'm on a platform because I'm too wee to be seen. And thank you very much for coming today. Um, I want to um, begin with a poem uh, that I wrote a few years ago in a book called Letters to My Mother and Other Mothers. And my mother warned me of climate change many years ago. She died in 2005. Climate refugees. We went to see a film on climate refugees where I felt your presence in the audience approving of the director's epiphanic images of the disastrous effect of depleting forests, the unrestrained harnessing of rivers, the traffic-choked roads, the thoughtless smoke of industries, the laying bare of grassland, jeopardizing multitudinous animal flocks, the bartering of prime land for building work. You would have felt the weariness of women walking desert miles to fetch pitchers of water. Your eyes would have caressed the children leaving play to queue up for food aid gifts. But even you, Ma, could not have foreseen how close to the brink we stand of new continental shifts. As the Sundarbans will disappear with their millions, the Maldives will dive below the Indian Ocean, the tu and Tuvalu will sink without a blink from the world's nations. And islands of the East and West Indies, which drew traders and colonizers 
in a struggle for ownership will not have any competitor vying for their crew as these tropical dreams are engulfed by mighty streams. The rivers you knew flowing with majestic assurance from the Himalayan peaks and Tibet's proud plateau, the Ganga and the Jamuna, the Mekong and the Irrawaddy, the Yangtze Kiang now flood in spring and shrink every year as the snow melts steadily without replenishment. As the global warming continues with the debate, many spurn, but you are here today, not spurning the debate. Not ready to accept the climate refugees, marooned to greet a turning grave. So the earth is stoically paused now for a new embrace, Ma, bracing itself for a salt water invasion that will substantially deplete its population. I, I want to begin with the lecture and then move on to my uh, talk. I would like to thank my dear friend, Beth Juna, the director of the Juna Gallery, for inviting me to speak today about Rabindranath Tagore. Beth herself is a well-known poet, writer, arts entrepreneur and activist, and by profession, a trained speech and language therapist. So she has consistently been a champion of expression through words, art and action, all of which are reflected in Rabindranath Tagore's own work. I'm especially grateful and thrilled to be here in the Green Zone, a space which Rabindranath would have welcomed, and it is most fulfilling to be part of the environmental debates as we face the reality of climate change during the COP26 summit in Glasgow, our host city. It is both an honor and a privilege to be speaking here today as the director of the Scottish Centre of Tagore Studies. I would like to thank the whole IT team led by Alan and Ian and others. Andrew, I, if I miss out your names, forgive me, but they've been marvellous. Uh, and Katie, thank you very much. Um, the theme of my paper is Rabindranath Tagore and the environment. And I will illustrate how Rabindranath's ideas and work remain relevant today and consider what his message to us would be as we face environmental degradation, which has brought about the climate crisis. I will be looking at Rabindranath's personal encounter with his natural surroundings, his environmental concerns, which are closely intertwined with his educational projects and see how they resonate with the postmodern audience. In a recent article in The Guardian, Bill McKibben has brought home to us what we witnessed since what we have witnessed since the Paris Accord in December 2015. He sums up the global experience thus, I quote, we've endured the hottest heat waves, the biggest and fastest storms, the highest winds, the heaviest rains. We watched both the jet stream and the Gulf Stream sputter the physical world, once backdrop, is now foreground, a well-lit stage on which the drama will play out. But do we want this drama to be played out with any meaningful, without any meaningful intervention on our part? McKibben goes on to say, I quote, every huge forest fire, every hurricane strike, every month of drought heightens the demand for change but every distraction weakens the demand. A change in attitude and policy to rest the world from the brink of disaster is what COP26 seeks to achieve through play, placing on the table the reality of tangible threats to human life and habitation and the whole cycle of life that we are part of and feel responsible for as sentient beings, blessed by reason and gifted with imagination, which if aided by willpower can reverse a tragedy too grim for words. We are holding our talks, protests, agitations and debates 
in 2021, a very significant year for us. It is Rabindranath Tagore's 160th anniversary, his 80th death anniversary. It is a centenary of the formal establishment of Tagore's educational institution Vishwa Bharati at Shantiniketan in India. It is the 50th anniversary of the founding of Bangladesh. It's a birth centenary of the film, Bengali film director Satyajit Ray, birth centenary, who studied at Tagore's institution in Shantiniketan, who made wonderful films, won the Oscar of Oscars, the La Lumiere from France, but also directed in 1961, a documentary on Tagore, which I will encourage you to watch if you can. Tagore was born in Jura Shako in 1861, the seat of the Tagores in Calcutta, the metropolis on the banks of the River Hooghly, which was the capital of British India till 1911-12. The Tagore's family seat at Jura Shago, Calcutta, now Kolkata, was at the heart of the Bengal Renaissance, the religious, literary, and social reform movement, which catapulted India into the modern era. When I speak of India, I mean the subcontinent. For me, that is India. Durashako embodied the confluence that Calcutta signified as a meeting point of many cultures. The Tagore household was a beehive of creativity with the talented Tagores across three generations contributed actively on multiple fronts to educational and agricultural reform, business entrepreneurship, literature and art, while also promoting indigenous arts, crafts and production. It was in this atmosphere of creative innovation that Rabindranath was born and grew up. I refer to him as Rabindranath because there are too many Tagores of too much talent, so we have to distinguish. And in India, we call him Rabindranath. He died in 1941, six years before India's independence, and thus did not have to witness her partition and the displacement of 14 to 18 million people, which would have pained him greatly, as he was a man who celebrated India's diversity and coined the term unity in diversity, used across India today. In his 80 years, he not only packed in a life crowded with activity, writing in multiple genres, composing songs over 2,200, paintings over 2,400, numerous letters, around 16,000, primers, have you heard of a Nobel laureate writing primers? Science tracts, sermons, essays, but he also established and managed educational institutions from primary, secondary, tertiary, to vocational and research centers, a rural reconstruction center and cooperatives. In short, he was a polymath, a Renaissance man. When Rabindranath was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1913 for literature, the first non-Westerner to receive it, he was already a celebrity in Bengal, a powerful voice in India. The Nobel Award thrust Rabindranath on the global stage. He realized the international role and opportunity this provided. And this was when he refashioned himself as a bilingual writer, appealing to a worldwide audience. Translating from his native Bengali and writing directly in English, delivering lectures on invitation, addressing vast audiences nationally and internationally. And this is an example of his writing. He, he changed an entire nation's, I mean, the Bengali nation's writing by his beautiful handwriting. He met key individuals and addressed diverse audiences who gathered in crowds to see and hear him in the East and the West. He took on a one-man mission to bring the East and West together on a platform of mutual understanding and mutual respect, making an appeal for cooperation between nations, which COP26 is striving to achieve in a massive collab collaborative effort. Rabindranath's sensitivity to nature began at Jurashako. 
where the young boy felt trapped between the wall, within the walls of the magnificent sprawling family home. Gazing, he gazed longingly through the French shutters at the pond and palm trees beyond the wall. When Dengue threatened Calcutta, his father, Devendranath, sent the children to a house at Panihati on the Adi Ganga River, where Rabindranath enjoyed a close communion with nature as he walked along the river and explored the large garden. At 12, after his sacred thread ceremony, he was overjoyed when he was asked to accompany his father on one of his many travels. At their first stop at Shantanigatan, which means the abode of peace, Rabindranath enjoyed an unfettered freedom for the first time of the open fields and a sense of peace, which he would feel every time he returned here. Here, he says, he was a Gulliver in his own little Lilliput, an overlord over little hillocks and pools of water. At their final stop in Bakrota in the Himalayas, he experienced the maj majesty of the mountains, the pristine beauty of the Himalayan peaks, the resplendence of the wild spring flowers. Here the stars in the night sky became the book his father used for his lessons in astronomy, amongst many lessons in other subjects. His first trip abroad at 17 was to study at London University in 1878. Here the cold, wet streets of the city depressed him. But on a trip to Torquay in Devonshire in 1879 with his sister-in-law, Gyanodha Nundini, and his nephew and niece, the picturesque landscape revived him and remained with him, uh, for him an indelible memory. And we will return to this later. A few years after his return from London, his perceptive father, mind you, he was the 14th son. So he was actually the youngest living son. So father, noting his inner strength and integrity in his poet's son and detecting a visionary and a pragmatist in him, entrusted him with the supervision of the family estates in and around Shilaidaho, which is now in Bangladesh. And that's the boat, the Padma, the Bajaro on which he went and he wrote many of his short stories. It was here in the land watered by the mighty river Padma, that, or Padda as we call her, that Rabindranath encountered the apathy, poverty, and struggle of his countrymen in rural Bengal. The changing landscape of a riverine terrain and the beauty of his Shonar Bangla, his golden Bengal, produced a raft of songs, poetry, plays, and his famous short stories, depicting the lives of ordinary village folk. It was here that he began his rural reconstruction projects and cooperatives in his family estates to improve and protect agrarian life and economy. My own journey with Rabindranath began as a girl, reading his poetry, listening to his songs, and dancing to them and choreographing his inimitable dance dramas, enacting his plays, and of course, devouring his fiction. But my own academic interest in Rabindranath's work began in Edinburgh, many years later, when the Patrick Geddes scholar, Murdo MacDonald, who was a professor of Scottish art history, introduced me to the letters from Rabindranath to Patrick Geddes, held at the National Library of Scotland. Geddes, I discovered, was a town planner, a conservation architect, an environmentalist, an educationist, in short, a polymath, like Rabindranath, another Renaissance man. Murdo sent me on a quest to find the other side of the correspondence, from Geddes to Rabindranath, which led me to Rabindra Bhavan, the Tagore Art Archives held at Vishwabharati Tagore's University, International University. What struck me then was that Geddes, at 60, journeyed to India in 1914, turning his back on Europe, gripped by World War I. He had been given letters of introduction to leading figures in India, including Rabindranath who was already well known as a Nobel laureate. 
Geddes's meetings and correspondence with Rabindranath in, is an East meets West saga of friendship between men who were both peace warriors and liberal humanists with a deep attachment to nature and a commitment to human betterment. My encounter with their correspondence led me to edit the letters between these two great minds. It's been published in three revised editions uh, and uh, another one is coming out this year. Another revised edition, the fourth one, who shared similar ideas on education as the fulcrum to development of the mind for nation building in institutions which were rooted in the environment and were connected to the hinterland in a seamless cultural continuity that made them sustainable. In a later collaborative research project involving several scholars from India and Scotland, which I led in the UK and Tapati Mukherjee led in India, we published two books and one of them is Confluence of Minds. The Rabindranath Tagore and Patrick Geddes Reader on Education and the Environment. As you'll see, both of them are way beyond their time. My own intro introduction to this ocean of knowledge, creativity, and multifarious activity in Rabindranath has led me to write a critical, comprehensive biography, which was commissioned by Reaction Books, Calcutta, uh, sorry, London, and published as part of their Critical Lives series. My research enabled me to make several trips to Shantinigatan, Rabindranath's abode of peace, a place of pilgrimage which I urge all of you to make and you won't regret it. It's most uplifting. It was here that Rabindranath founded his school in 1900 and in the Nobel Committee's citation for the award, they mentioned his educational work and his rural regeneration projects. The vast dry fields of Bolpur district with a few straggling palms, an impressive chatim tree, and some mango trees have been transformed by his father Debendranath, by Rabindranath himself and his son Rothindranath to a revolutionary green mantle with multiple trees and flowering gardens. In 1921, Rabindranath founded India's first international University at Shantini Gatan, Vishya Bharati. By the way, that building is one of five in that complex and the poet moved restlessly between them. Vishya Bharati means, has the motto where the whole world meets in one nest. The Chatim tree I mentioned earlier, under which Rabindranath's father, Maharshi Rabindranath, had meditated, became the emblem of enlightenment for Rabindranath. As during the first, convoc first convocations of the university, the students being awarded degrees were presented with a chatim leaf, a symbol of life and learning. And if you go to the Scottish Poetry Library, you'll find the, their motto is, by leaves we live, which is from Patrick Geddes. Rabindranath invited Patrick Geddes to provide plans for his international university, and Geddes did. In fact, Patrick Geddes spent nine years in India providing plans on invitation for over 50 towns and cities. He was professor of civics and sociology at Bombay University, putting into practice his belief in interdisciplinary studies, which Rabindranath too espoused in his institution, Vishya Bharati. But Patrick Geddes, like Rabindranath, was a busy man a restless spirit with many ideas and projects which carried him away on many travels. So he was not always present. His son, Arthur Geddes, the geographer, was invited by Rabindranath to come and teach at his institution, which Arthur, Arthur did. And Arthur stayed two years in Shantanigatan. Arthur was a violinist and sang and translated 14 songs of Tagore with notations which are available in print today. In that photograph, you'll find Patrick Geddes um, at, at the end over there, standing, um, and Arthur Geddes sitting below him on the floor, on the right. Am I saying the right thing, on the right, or is it your left? Left, so your left, and Patrick Geddes is also on, on your left. So many of those songs are on nature. 
especially seasons, the season of hope and renewal, spring. I quote, today the gates of the south are open. Let spring enter. Aji dokino doar kola, amar boshan to isho. About an egalitarian society, we are all rajas royal, one and all equal. Amra shabai raja, amaderi raja rajate or reflecting the fearless innovator and visionary in the protesting poet, if no one hears your call, then walk alone. It is here in Shantiniketan that Arthur encountered Rabindranath's work in writing and practice at first hand. As a true modern, Rabindranath transformed his institution from its initial brahmacharya ashram beginnings to a secular educational center befitting a modern nation which aimed at social inclusion. In his letters home to his father, Arthur wrote about education and ecology being the twin facets of Rabindranath's methods of raising awareness about a sustainable environment in a play, Mask of the Desert, where the desert is pushed back by digging a channel of flowing water and deforestation averted and drought stalled. And by the tree planting ceremony, and you see a picture of that there, Brikkurupun, initiated by Rabindranath, through which he gave the primacy to local festivals, which were tied to the changing seasons, to folk traditions and customs, like the spring festival, Boshantushab. Even today, if you go there every year, the girls and boys dance the spring, fest spring in or the Holocaust and the plough ceremony. For Rabindranath, the tree planting ceremony was symbolic of a greater reality. The recognition of the forest as crucial for the protection of life on earth. And here's a little poem from him. The tree doesn't give fruit to pay a debt. Its whole life is giving. If somebody comes to pick, the fruit is his luck, not what is owing. Brikkurupun, tree planting, which is still observed every year, signifies afforestation as a method of pushing back the desert, a pledge that has, to be take, that has already been taken at this COP26 meeting to reverse deforestation and arrest CO2 emissions. Rabindranath's early experience at Shilai Daho, which in his family estates, which inculcated the urgency of investing in rural resuscitation projects to revive self-reliance and dignity in his countrymen, was a realization he brought to the establishment of Srinigatan in 1922, a year after he established Vishwabharati. His rural regeneration center, the sister institution of Shantinigatan, which Arthur supervised and taught in when its director, Leonard, Elmhurst was away on his travels, and that is Srinikatan. At Srinikatan, Rabindranath reached out with his students and staff to the rural hinterland with the help of the agricultural scientist Leonard K. Elmhurst, the, an Englishman whom he met uh, in America. In a rural, and Elmhurst initiated the rural regeneration program of resuscitating the small farm holdings, the village arts and crafts, while also learning from the village folk in a two-way bridge building process. Elmhurst documented his Srinikatan experience in his book, Poet and Plowman, and Rabindranath wrote the introduction, The Robbery of the Soil, and I quote from it. The standard of living in modern civilization has been raised far higher than the average level of our necessity. The strain which this entails serves at the outset to increase our physical and mental alertness. The claim upon our energy accelerates growth. This in its turn produces activity that expresses itself by raising life's standard still higher. Doesn't it seem familiar? And you wrote this so many years ago. When this standard attains a degree that is a great deal above the normal, it encourages the passion for greed, unquote. This sounds very familiar to us today, as we are 
uh, as we are faced with corporate greed and the irresponsible expansion of industrial farming, mining, and unmitigated growth. When Elmhurst returned to England to establish an institution with Sriniketan as his model, he asked Rabindranath where he could locate it. Rabindranath's unhesitating reply was Totnes in Devonshire. You remember? He spent a beautiful holiday there once. The very place he had spent a reviving holiday with his sister-in-law's family in an escape from London. This county had suffered from a sense of despondency after the war, and Dartington Hall lit a flame of hope and inspiration for the local arts, crafts, and agriculture in the hinterland, just as Vishwa Bharati and Srinigatan have done. Romindranath and Elmhurst's legacy lives at Dartington, which advocates, and I quote from their website, Dartington Hall's website, a just and sustainable way of living in a center of learning in ecology, the arts, and social justice. And Beth has already mentioned social justice. Dartington Hall's Tagore Festival, which has been stalled for two years, and Vocational College augment the creative and cultural life in the area. Like Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, Rabindranath believed that the earth had enough for our needs, but not for our greed. And like Gandhi, he advocated a life of simplicity. I quote from Tagore, where life is simple, wealth does not become too ex exclusive, and owners of individual property find no great difficulty in acknowledging their communal responsibility. In fact, wealth can even become the best channel for social communication, as we saw in his own reforms as a landowner. What Rabindranath is, ad as, is advocating is a collective responsibility to promote and ensure social well-being. He goes on to warn us, and I quote from him, in a society where the greed of an individual or of a group is allowed to grow uncontrolled and is encouraged or even applauded by the populace, democracy cannot be truly realized. And this was before India had become a democracy. At the COP26 summit, the move to protect the world's forests and stall deforestation is something the poet would have hailed as salutary. He begins his seminal essay, The Religion of the Forest, thus, I quote, we stand before this great world. The truth of our life depends upon our attitude of mind towards it. An attitude which is formed by a habit, by our habit of dealing with it according to the special circumstances of our surroundings and our temperaments. It guides our attempts to establish relations with the universe, either by conquest or by union either through the cultivation of power or through that of sympathy. And thus, in our realization of the truth of existence, we put our emphasis either upon the principle of dualism or upon the principle of unity. The choice is ours. And I think our generation has failed the young and it's for the young to change everything. So we leave it to you. The principle of the unity of all things affirms humankind as a part of a continuum of life on this earth, an interdependent chain that can only survive through a fine balance achieved through her comprehensiveness of sympathy that recognizes a kinship between all things. In order to inculcate the centrality of nature in our lives, the prayer room, which is that stained glass room at Shantanigatan, is where secular prayer, meditation and reflection and meetings are held, with songs, poetry and sermons on the significance of nature and the bonds of shared work and commitment. Rabindranath, as you can see, held classes under the trees in his ashram his classroom without walls, 
Remember how he detested the walls of his family uh, seat. Very much in the tradition of the Tapovan, the forest hermitage of ancient India. Not in a back to the primitive program, but in acknowledgement of making his institution a continuation of its surroundings, rooted in nature, thriving on an emphasis on simplicity in a holistic education built on shared responsibilities. He states how, and I'm quoting from Rabindranath, how democratic governments can give joy rights to the rich and clever, how they can control, quote, the organs of information and expression through manufactured opinions to benefit the prosperous few, unquote. In short, if those in power act irresponsibly, they don't bring relief or succor to the suffering populace in times of crisis that we're facing now, like the climate crisis. During the COVID pandemic, we have seen how it spread like wildfire through the world. And, those, and of those who succumb to it, a disproportionate number belong to the disadvantaged groups, those who dwell on the margins of our unequal societies. So what would Rabindranath have advocated today as the poet? What would his message be? In his essay, Can Science Be Humanized? He says, we can only hope that science herself will help us bring back sanity to the human world by lessening the opportunity to gamble with our fortune. Incidentally, my daughter is a scientist working on the COVID-19 disease map. He would have listened to the scientists and welcomed the vaccine as the right way out for us today from the clutches of the coronavirus, which hasn't gone away. But above all, Rabindranath, as the advocate of ecological sustainability, would have urged the world to heed the warning and urgent advice of climate scientists to avoid the rampant destruction of our natural world for industrial farming and unconscionable economic growth in the name of development and address climate crisis in order to avoid more frequent and deadly viruses from escaping the wilderness, their natural habitat, and decimating the human population. When asked what he had done at Shantinigatan, which you see there, that made it different, different, Rabindranath said he had not done anything spectacular, but he had created an atmosphere, a polybesh an environment whose founding principle was simplicity, nurtured by the comprehensiveness of sympathy and interchange that ensured harmony in what Rabindranath proposed as the unity of all things. The eco-critic Devarati Bandipadhyay has urged us, and I quote from her, to view Rabindranath's idea of the organic nature of the community as basic to the idea of a sustainable ecological environment. Like the romantic William Wordsworth, Rabindranath believed nature never did betray the heart that loved her. With the philosopher and pragmatist Rabindranath, we too can have a pact with nature, can't we? To love and save her, which will prevent the suffering that pestilence brings. And I will end with a poem from him, to quote from him, let the mists be gone from the mountains this morning. Let a fresh dawn sun bring a new awakening. Let silence be broken by the message that comes flowing from heaven in hundreds of streams. Tagore had many international friends, amongst whom was Einstein, national and international friends. Einstein sent this message for the Golden Book of Tagore, which was compiled by some of the leading minds of India during the poet's 70th anniversary. Einstein's words perhaps best sum up our debt to the poet philosopher, the pragmatist and dedicated environmentalist. 
thou hast served mankind all through a long and fruitful life, spreading everywhere a gentle and free thought in a manner such as the seers of thy people have proclaimed as the idea. I will end with a poem that I wrote. It is part of a quartet, and this is the third one, Rabindranath. Uh, when he was walking along the streets of Ober Amagau uh, in his long robes, um, a father asked a child, do you know who that is? And the father knew who it was, and the child said, oh, that's God. So, uh, and uh, I more or less, the talk has summed up this, what I'm going to read now. Um, so it's a Petrarchan sonnet, right? A child in Europe unhesitatingly said of you, oh, that is God. Did you see that indomitable spark that India and the world saw glowing in the dark as movements of self-rule paralyzed the few and mobilized the millions? But it was you who stood apart, building cooperative arcs to house the peasants' output and see them disembark at marketplaces as your schemes were set to renew a country. You built a nest where East and West met as partners in exchange, anticipating a world of mutual respect. We owe you the anthems of two proud nations, India and Bangladesh. You sang a people to bond and a border to relent. You changed a generation's handwriting. Remember that handwriting slide? With your usual artistry and refined language to express every emotion. Thank you. I won't read my third poem because I want to leave time for questions and interaction. And you will find uh, the biography reaction, from Reaction Books and also Patient Dignity, which is uh, we brought out in 2021 uh, with uh, me and Vipa Pankaj, the artist collaborating. And it is a response to the pandemic, the year. And poetry and art help Vibhani to hold on to our sanity and hope. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Beth. And thank you, Green Zone and the entire team. And thank you for listening and coming. Thank you so much, Pashupi. It was a beautiful introduction to this thinker who was so uh, modern and prescient for our current times. I, I feel that in a way we, we've only just uh, received an introduction and skimmed the surface. There's so much more to discover about Tagore and his wisdom and intellect and his legacy uh, for us. Uh, uh, thank you so much for this uh, introduction to his, his work. Uh, we do have time for some questions now. And in the room, there are two microphones, one here and one at this side. So please, uh, if you have any comments or uh, thoughts, observations, uh, questions for Bashabi, please make your way to one of the microphones. And uh, thank you in advance for contributing to the discussion. Hi all. Uh, this is Navneet from University of Glasgow. I am from India. So uh, it was very nice uh, and uh, I saw the uh, participations of many people. Uh, uh, this is really so good. Understanding a person um, who has done such a great job entire his life uh, is not so easy. But uh, uh, it's my personal uh, opinion and I would ask from you uh, Dr. Bhashbi, that what should be the take-home lesson uh, according to your experience for us? We are young and what we can do uh, as a small part, because we cannot do big things, but we can do small things. So that's it. Thank you. Well, that's a profound question and a big one. Uh, and I think what we can do is um, work together, collaborate, talk to people, and believe in the unity of all things. 
and also try to keep our needs as simple as possible. I say this, but I use an electric kettle and I use a washing machine like everybody else and a dishwasher. I, I don't know what my answer is, but I do think that we can still, I mean, what the pandemic has taught us is we don't really need a lot. You know, I, I now have lots of black bags that I am giving away and maybe we can all work together and try to do our own little bit by simplifying our needs as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And put pressure on the governments. So it's a, a kind of two-pronged approach. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think what uh, Rabindranath is teaching us as well is he was also a great pragmatist uh, and uh, activist and not to take on the whole burden uh, of this um, individualization of, of responsibility for what's happening now, but as Bashabi says, to remain vigilant as well as to what uh, they're doing across the river and what the politicians uh, are doing. And it was he accepted as a pragmatist as much as a, a almost mystic seer, or did people want to keep him in this uh, box of mysticism? How did yeah. they respond to that? Initially, I think uh, in the West, he was sort of seen as the prophet, the mystic. And I think uh, that's when his reputation was at its highest. But when he actually emerged as a pragmatist, I, I think his pop popularity fell. fell a lot and uh, um, and yet that was that's what he was I mean people like Tolstoy would have understood him very well because Tolstoy also believed in um, community farming and hands-on approach uh, and living amidst nature but I think the main thing to take away from Rabindranath is is the respect for everybody you know the not a kind of uh, an idea of being any any group being superior to another, but everybody deserves an opportunity to re realize their full creative principle, and that is the message we should take away from Tagore. And it is uh, Beth mentioned creativity. It's a creative principle that will help us to creatively deal with climate change. And culture and art can do that. But I also think interdisciplinarity. I mean, for a long time, we have uh, sort of separated uh, the disciplines. And this is what Patrick Geddes, the generalist, advocated. We need to talk to each other. You know, the scientists and the social scientists and the humanities and the art artists need to talk to each other. We, because we all are part of a conglomerate, a society. It's a network. And once this network, you know, communicates with everybody, then there will be change, positive change. And I think we have another question from the floor. Um, yes, yeah, I think uh, reaction. Um, so you were speaking um, Bashavi, about the kind of industrial agriculture, and I chose to come to this event rather than um, an event happening at the same time at the Sustainable Innovation Forum just down the road about the necessity for continuing of industrial agriculture. Um, so just quite an interesting juxtaposition. Um, and you spoke also of the, well, quoting... Um, with Indra of the unity, recognition of the unity of all living things. And I, I think when we ask about what can we each do as individuals, my understanding is, or my, my thoughts on that is, we each can do a small thing, but we have a collective responsibility to achieve huge things, you know, big things, um, to transform systems, um, and to challenge uh, 
perhaps what is being spoken about down the road um, about the continuing growth of business and industrial agriculture and so on. Um, so yeah, thank you for uh, this perspective. And um, I think just call on everyone as part of this session to recognize that the, the small things are all part of a bigger collective action and transformation um, that we're all jointly responsible for. Can I just say thank you for coming here rather than there? <laughs> <laughs> that's very noble of you. And I absolutely agree with you. And that's what Rabindranath did. You know, he, he established this one school, one university, one r rural reconstruction center. He thought, he felt that it could be a small flame that could light uh, inspiring recurrent flames across the country, across the world. And actually it was a, a real international university because people from East and West, great minds came from all disciplines to Vishwabharati to teach, to learn, to talk to each other. So I think you're absolutely right. We do what we do in our small way and it does have a, ripples have an effect and they can create wonders. So yes. We have some questions as mm. well from our online viewers. And uh, this is one. Um, uh, what work of Rabindranath should I start with to become more familiar with it? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it, it also depends on what you enjoy. If you enjoy fiction, you can start with The Home and the World. If you enjoy short stories, there's a whole collection. You could go there. Uh, poetry, I, I would say um, there are some excellent translations by William Radice, by Ketuki Kushari Dyson, and by Shukanto Jodhuri, amongst others. So you can look out for their translations. And of course, I would also say The Gardener, apart from Gitanjali, which is one of my favorites. Oh, thank you. And we also have a question from the um, landscape artist, Ruth Nicol, and she wants to know, can you see, identify any present day intellectual and environmentally collaborations between Scotland and Bangladesh? Can you give us hope? Um, the answer is yes, come to us come to the Scottish Centre of Tagore Studies and we'll work together in collaborative projects. Ruth, Thank please you. do. Yes. 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 So, mm. so become more involved and in, this is online mm -hmm. and also through your journal, Gitanjali yeah, and, and Beyond from the, mm -hmm. uh, the Scottish Centre of Tagore Studies. Yes, please uh, contribute to Gitanjali and Beyond. Ruth should send her paintings to us and we will publish them. Oh, I think she'll be <laughs> absolutely thrilled uh, to hear that. Oh, wonderful. Can I, think... I just add one thing to the previous questioner? Uh, I would also encourage the questioner to read Nationalism by Rabindranath. Okay. Yes. Nationalism. Yes. Uh, there I are three essays there. That's very pertinent for pertinent what's today. happening in Scotland today. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think what I feel uh, so strongly at the moment is immense gratitude to you, Pashabi, for bringing Tagore to us. Uh, I, I mean, it's completely safe to say that there is no one else in Scotland who has done more to bring Tagore uh, to us in Scotland and throughout the UK. Uh, than Bashabi Fraser, and uh, I feel very grateful to you for this enormous contribution. Uh, it is uh, inspiring and enriching. Uh, thank you very much. If there are no more questions uh, from the... Yes, we have one more question from the floor, please. Um, hi, so this is actually not a question. I would just like to share something. Uh, I'm from India, I'm Shreyoshi, and uh, I have my roots back in Calcutta. So, like to add to what ma'am said, so we grew up, you know, uh, listening to Rabindranath's song, and 
so music and dance is engraved in our culture so we are, we, we grew up dancing to robindra sangeet and we we worship him we celebrate his birthday every year it's like a big celebration for us so yes i'm i'm so glad like uh, this event happened like when i saw the uh, the event is happening i really wanted to attend it so i'm i'm glad i'm here so yes i just wanted to share thank you thank so you so much. much for for that and this brings a meeting to a close this question. event to a close and i'm afraid we've run out of time now but uh, bashibi will be meeting with you outside where some of her books are also on sale but thank you so much thank you bashibi